So um, you may have noticed I'm not Alex Roberts. I'm very sad about that. I wish I was. Um, I hope I can step into her shoes um, as she is unavoidably absent today. Um, but she's put together this incredible panel. Um, I'm Mary Catherine Amarine. I'm a former Edison Fellow with SIP Squared and Copyright and Trademark Litigator with King and & Below. And I'm thrilled to be here discussing uh, trademark and first sale with everyone. Um, I know this is a particularly interesting issue that raises some curious questions about consumer confusion and consumer protection, but also environmentalism and sustainability and um, even creative expression and artistic influence as well. So I know we have some great panelists here. Um, we have Professor Dan Cahoy, who is, and I've lost my notes already, <laughs> he's at uh, Penn State University's Smeal College of Business and a research director at the Center for the Business of Sustainability, as well as a senior scholar at SIP Squared. Then we have Evan Gorvitz at Ropes and Gray, uh, Sari Mazurko, assistant professor of law at SMU Dedman School of Law, and Kate Saba, an associate at Debevoy and Plimpton. And our two professors have written absolutely incredible law review articles on this topic. Um, they're really, really excellent and insightful, and I'm thrilled to hear them speaking about it. And then on the practitioner side, we have um, attorneys who have been in the trenches working with clients and seeing these issues and how they play out firsthand in the field. So that'll be a really, really exciting perspective to get as well. So I think I'm just going to start by letting our experts take the stage. You All right, uh, yeah, why don't you start off? Great. All right, great, thanks. Uh, oop, let's see, let me uh, get my computer on here. Um, so uh, yeah, great, so thank you. Uh, thanks, Mary, for that excellent introduction. Um, and so uh, yeah, so uh, this is a topic, uh, so typically um, I, I'm more of a patent academic, but I got involved and interested in this topic because of a former student at Penn State who started a company uh, that uh, uh, makes uh, modern watches, or not actually refurbished watches, out of old watch movements that were in um, uh, pocket watches that were issued to soldiers in World War I, World War II, at least that was kind of the starting of his idea, and he uh, created a company called Vortic, which you might have heard of, I've heard about one of the cases they were involved in, involving a large Swiss company called uh, Swatch um, that owned the Hamilton brand. Uh, and he told me about some of the trials and tribulations he had uh, in trying to make his company work and actually produce watches that actually had the Hamilton brand on them because they were originally Hamilton watches produced in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, and thought this was a really interesting idea, an interesting way of refurbishing. And so when he was sued for trademark infringement, he was really stunned and surprised. And this kind of got me excited and interested about the topic because I believe a lot in sustainability. It seemed to me that what you have here is an example of how trademark law can kind of get in the way of sustainability, um, act as sort of a barrier to things that we want to see happen, that is keeping goods on the market in some form longer than they otherwise might be. Um, but... Uh, there also has to be, of course, some understanding of the brand owner's interest in enforcing uh, the uh, against the consumer confusion that could result if people are using your brand name in a way on products that aren't the kinds of things that you sell and confuse consumers as to the quality um, or, or uh, goodwill um, involved in, in, in your uh, in your product. So, so just to say, one thing I wanted to make a point about is, you know, in addition to sort of the art aspects of upcycling, um, sustainability is an important part of it as well. So, you know, being able to keep goods on the market um, or at least in use in some form for a little bit longer can save a tremendous amount of energy, can, can reduce carbon emissions, can save the environment, stop landfills from being filled um, and replacing the land with garbage. Um, these are important things. And so, you know, among the ways to do it, of course, you can recycle goods, but that involves destroying the goods and that actually act consumes some energy in and of itself, but keeping things on in some form is actually really useful. Consumers can do it by refurbishing their own goods, and you know, we, our ability to repair our own goods has actually been the subject of a lot of discussion as well, right? So people have some concerns about whether we can get into our phones to repair them and whether Apple is giving us sufficient means to be able to do that. That's one issue, and of course the FTC covered that quite well in the Nixing the Fix report they put out a few years ago. Um, but I'm also interested in, in when consumers don't want to keep their own products, they want to 
give them away, they want to sell them away, they want to throw them away, but then there's the possibility of another firm capturing this, of remaking them into something else, refurbishing them into something else, maybe into a different kind of product, uh, taking a polo shirt and making it into a polo hat, uh, taking a car with a gas engine and making it into an electric car, which may involve keeping the trademarks on the original goods. So, you know, you take your Porsche, you replace the engine with an electric motor, and now it's incredibly fast and handles quite a bit differently and probably weighs a lot more, but it still says Porsche on the outside. So is that a Porsche? That's a really interesting question, and Porsche absolutely cares about that question. So um, that's, you know, kind of where I, I have an interest in this area. Um, and um, I think, you know, among the problems that, uh, and this is in, in my uh, Colorado Law Review article too, if you want to uh, take some more, uh, if you take a deeper dive into some of the things I, I'm talking about here, but there are some particular problems that caused uh, uh, some significant concern for RT Custer and Vortic, the watch company, but also potentially create problems for anyone who wants to get into this area. Um, and so one is, you know, when you, uh, the, the, the law essentially is that um, first sale, of course, generally allows you to resell any good that you've purchased in that original form without having any kind of concern about the trademark owner having the ability to stop you. But of course, if you make a material alteration, there is the possibility that consumers will be confused by the modified product and somehow attribute it back to the trademark owner. So generally, modification takes you out of the first sale protections. And so, you know, a lot of the uh, cases go into the question of, like, how much modification is too much modification. Actually, it doesn't take very much. Um, but one of the things that I think is understudied, um, and one of the things that I think, uh, oh, I don't have a lot of time yet, uh, left, that, it, uh, that, that actually has to be covered a little bit more and is worthy of some additional investigation is disclosure. Um, disclosure of your modification. So a number of courts give that quite a bit of weight. Um, some suggest that it might even alleviate you from having to go through the multi-part um, trademark confusion analysis. Some just would integrate it into the analysis. But I think, you know, how much disclosure is appropriate and can, are there cases where the modification is so strong that disclosure can't do anything to dissuade consumers from being confused? Another thing that's a really big problem potentially, I think, is post-sale confusion. So this is the thing in trademark counterfeiting, of course. This, this makes trademark counterfeiting um, a reasonable cause of action because uh, even if you buy the, the fake Rolex, knowing it's a fake Rolex, Rolex still has a cause of action for trademark infringement because other people will see the fake Rolex and realize it's of low quality and potentially attribute that back to, to, uh, to Rolex, even though they didn't buy it in the first place. And so that's another part here. Post-sale confusion is a potentially big issue if you are modifying the Porsche. Um, you're the company modifying the Porsche, and you're even the consumer buying the modified Porsche, but somebody else might see that modified Porsche and say, wow, that is an amazingly fast and well-handling car that doesn't seem like the 356 that I remember back from 1962. Um, let's see. Uh, in addition, I think there is, uh, a, a, as, by virtue of the, the Shop Safe Act and some other initiatives to try to kind of reverse the uh, Tiffany line of cases for online real, resellers, there's a potential to shut down a lot of these businesses before we even get to the process of litigating whether they have a right to exist because... Um, we're, uh, we're, we're talking about some legislation that might kind of shift the online world for trademark infringement to something more like a DMCA world where um, it, it, before things actually get resolved uh, with a notice and essentially uh, takedown of trademark goods, um, uh, online resellers will have a lot of power to stop the existence of these, um, uh, of these uh, upcycled goods in the first place. So, I mean, that's kind of an overview of some things that I think are actually important and a little bit understudied. And I guess the last point I'd make overall um, is simply that the uncertainty around these issues has a lot of relevance to small firms, to entrepreneurs, to people who are thinking that upcycling is a great new business idea. And so before we stop all this stuff, before it gets anywhere, I think it's, it's worth thinking through some of the potential pitfalls, some of the potential legal hurdles. So I'll, I'll stop there and let Evan uh, carry on. Okay, all right, thanks a lot. Um, there we go. Uh, okay, so hi everyone, I'm Evan Gorvitz. Uh, I'm an intellectual property litigator at Ropes and Gray in New York, focusing on copyright, trademark, and social media issues. Uh, I also used to work in-house as a litigation counsel at a famous company with a uh, lot of famous brands, 
Um, among other things, I've done work, including enforcement work for uh, Tiffany, Timberland, uh, DC Comics, a number of uh, other brands that you would almost certainly know. Um, <coughs> But for today, um, I assume that my colleagues are to some extent going to address uh, sort of the relevant law and recent developments about first sale law. And I thought I'd do something different and give some insight into how actual clients, and in particular how potential plaintiffs, usually think about these sorts of disputes and whether to bring these sorts of disputes. Uh, so the first thing I'd mention is that the people who are driving these lawsuits aren't necessarily in-house counsel at firms. Uh, they're not necessarily lawyers at all. They're often sales and marketing people at big companies who are concerned about a brand and its reputation and whether the kind of use at issue, the, um, the changed product at issue, is going to lose them sales or hurt their reputation or if it becomes more widespread, will cause them to lose sales uh, in the future. And they don't normally think about the uh, use at issue in the context of the law, in the context of first sale. They don't normally think, you know, do the changes made to this product make it materially different from those that we normally sell? Uh, they don't ask, are relevant consumers going to see this altered product and mistakenly believe that it comes from us? Uh, they don't ask, is this a work of art that raises First Amendment concerns? Uh, they don't ask, you know, do virtual copies of products representing real products that are, you know, kept in a vault somewhere, do those infringe? Generally, they assume, they simply presume that the altered products at issue, because they use the, the company's actual products as their foundation, and because as they see it, they rely on the prestige and the commercial magnetism of the client's brand for its appeal, uh, they just assume that that is likely to cause uh, relevant consumers to falsely believe that the altered products are at a minimum, you know, associated with them and their uh, authorized products. We as outside counsel, of course, try to make them aware of the legal landscape, of uh, the risks and benefits of taking action, depending on the specific circumstances at issue. But basically, these companies, in deciding whether or not they're going to take action against a given instance of this kind of conduct, they basically sort of focus on three things. They focus, what is the scope and the visibility of the use at issue? Is this a one-off by some sort of, you know, uh, artist living in a shack in Key West? Or is this like a, a big high publicity stunt that's being performed by like uh, a major brand or a major prankster like Mischief? Uh, you know, is, is how much coverage is this, this going to get? How much of a splash is it going to make? How much is it potentially going to splash back against us and our brand? Which brings us to the second question, which is, you know, does this use harm the status and the reputation of our brand? Um, you know, is, is it going to associate us with Satanism? Is it going to uh, make people think that we are associated with a particular celebrity, a particular... Um, trend, even a social media trend that we don't necessarily think is good or healthy. Um, and also, you know, if we did not take action against this specific situation, is it going to encourage other people to do the same sort of thing in the future? And is that going to, you know, have a positive impact on our brand? And then the third thing that they really focus on is, you know, does this use deprive us of revenue? Are we losing money? Is it causing us to lose money? Is it causing us to lose sales? Does it deprive us of the revenue that we'd get from an authorized collaboration? Does it provide, does it deprive us of the revenue that we get from a license agreement? And also, you know, if, is it going to kill future deals for these sorts of things, for these sorts of collaborations, because people are going to see this one particular unauthorized use and say, well, why on earth should we enter a collaboration? Why on earth should we enter a deal with you, a license for this, if we see that there's someone else who's doing it for free? Why should we spend $5 million for a deal with your brand if we can just go out there and do it ourselves? Yep. So in other words, when you're looking at the issue of first sale and you're looking at sort of how companies, how plaintiffs assess whether to take action, generally you have to look at two separate perspectives. You need to look at the legal perspective. What are the potential claims? Do those claims have merit? How likely would I be to prevail on those claims? And then you have to look at a number of practical concerns. How much is this potentially going to hurt our brand? How much is this going to potentially hurt our sales? How much is taking action here potentially going to uh, harm our reputation among uh, fans of our brand and people who basically 
have an interest in this sort of custom culture that's involved. In some cases, uh, you know, fans of the brand uh, might be uh, very encouraging of these sorts of, uh, you know, changes or collaborations or actions. In some cases, they may be very intolerant. You have to know your brand, you have to know your customers, you have to know the culture around it, and you need to know what kind of impact taking action would have or not have. And as I sometimes say, one of the hardest things you can ever try to convince a client to do is nothing. It's very, very hard to convince a client not to take action when there's an infringement like this or there's a potential infringement or use like this, uh, even if you think that they uh, don't have a great case. So just uh, some thoughts on the subject. Now I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Mazurko. Hi everyone, my name is Sari Mazurko and I'm an assistant professor of law at SMU Dedman School of Law. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. So we're here to focus on the current doctrinal limit of the first sale doctrine. When a purchaser makes a material alteration to a product and then resells it. The point of the material alteration limit is to ensure consumers get what they think they're getting. And in some cases it makes a lot of sense and it really helps consumers. So you could imagine, for instance, if someone bought a crate of Poland Spring bottles and dumped out the water and filled it with vodka and sold Poland Spring bottles full of vodka without saying they were full of vodka, obviously this reseller shouldn't benefit from the first sale doctrine because they're patently using the Poland Spring mark to sell their bathtub vodka. But there are a lot of subtler changes that nevertheless deprive resellers of the first sale doctrine's benefits. So for instance, selling used Rolex watches that incorporate some non-Rolex parts to continue to enable the watch to function as a watch, selling limousines that have been made out of Lincoln town cars, um, selling a boat built with a Suzuki snowblower motor as its power source. So if we take as a given that these cases don't benefit from the first sale doctrine because they involve material alterations. What happens then? How should trademark law handle these cases? So I have a paper coming out with Mark Lemley called The Exclusive Right to Customize. It should be published any day now. Um, and we make two doctrinal recommendations for how trademark law should handle materially altered and resold goods. So the foundation of our thinking is that trademark law shouldn't be in the business of policing what people do with the goods they buy in general. If a purchaser resells a good after it's been materially altered, there are two especially compelling cases in which those goods shouldn't be subject to a standard likelihood of confusion analysis. So the first case is when the alteration is itself creative expression, and we think it should be subject to the Rogers test from the seminal case, Rogers versus Grimaldi. And I'd add that this recommendation is still viable following the recent Supreme Court decision in VIP products. So you could take, for example, Lil Nas X and Mischief Satan Shoes. He took 666 genuine Nike sneakers, altered them aesthetically in some significant ways, including by adding a drop of human blood to the sole of every shoe, and resold them. The changes themselves involve significant creative expression, and the name used for the sneakers only amplifies that, Satan shoes. Another example are Jim Lasser's Obama Force One shoes. So he carved a portrait of President Obama and a phrase about his presidency into a single pair of Nike Air Force One shoes. Context matters here, though. It's qualitatively different when a major brand slaps its brand imagery on a third party's product as part of a promotional campaign. He was the previous one. Like McDonald's did like McDonald's did when it purchased a bunch of PlayStation 5 controllers, decorated them in McDonald's insignia, and gave them away as part of a promotional campaign. We'd consider that commercial speech, speech that proposes a commercial transaction that shouldn't benefit from the application of the Rogers test. 
Second, when the underlying branded good has been incorporated into a new configuration, the reseller should be able to raise a nominative use defense. So I appreciate that Professor Cahoy was talking about the Vortic case because it's one that I think about a lot. So when Vortic takes vintage Hamilton pocket watches and repurposes them into Vortic wristwatches and retains the Hamilton mark on the pocket watch face, it should be able, it should be entitled to try to make the showing that the Hamilton component is not readily identifiable without the use of the Hamilton mark, and that Vortic used only so much of the Hamilton mark as reasonably necessary to identify the component. And if it can make those showings, its use of the Hamilton mark on the watch face should be permitted. But if Vortic made some other statements, meaning outside of the act of incorporating the Hamilton components into the Vortic watch, to suggest that it had Hamilton sponsor sponsorship or endorsement, its use of the Hamilton mark in that application should not be protected, potentially. So there's a third line of cases I'd like to add, and they're so mundane, but as a matter of doctrine, they could still incur trademark liability. If someone purchases some volume of consumer goods whose marks are interior, minimal, or otherwise obscure, and makes major changes to the goods but retains the marks and resells them, this too would constitute a material alteration. But what we're talking about in this case is a six-year-old who buys a box of Hanes t-shirts, tie-dyes them, and resells them in a school fair. Someone who buys simple iPhone cases, bedazzles them in rhinestones, and sells them on their Etsy shop. Someone who buys Reynolds wrap, cupcake wrappers, fills them with cupcake batter, bakes it, and sells it in a church bake sale. Should these uses be subject to a likelihood of confusion analysis? We think they shouldn't be because the uses these folks are making aren't trademark uses of the underlying brand's trademark. They're not using the Reynolds mark to brand their cupcakes. They're not even really using it to refer to the origin of the cupcake liners. They're not using it at all. So for this class of cases, rather than make a doctrinal recommendation, we advise that for these sorts of uses or really non-uses of trademarks on materially altered goods, they should simply be outside the scope of trademark law. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Saba. I'm a litigator at Debevoys and Plimpton. I primarily focus on trademark litigation, but also work on false advertising, copyright, and right of publicity litigation. I'm here to kind of provide the counter to mm -hmm. Evan. So what happens when one of Evan's clients decides to take action and they file a lawsuit? Um, Debevoise represents the artist Mischief. We've seen his Satan shoes up on, on the screen. Um, we also represent a company called StockX. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a case in which StockX is involved. Um, Nike sued StockX for trademark infringement concerning a product called Vault NFTs. So StockX is an online resale marketplace. It's a marketplace that people use to sell collectible goods, and often that includes sneakers. Uh, StockX has a unique program where they authenticate any product that's sold through their marketplace. So when a consumer wants to purchase a product on StockX, the seller actually ships the product to StockX. StockX examines it, cons uh, considers that it, whether it's actually what it purports to be, confirms that it's the correct product, and if it is, ships that product onto the buyer. Now that process, while a great uh, opportunity to confirm that consumers are getting what they're actually looking to buy, takes time and costs money. It requires extra shipping back and forth to StockX. There are costs associated with the authentication process. Um, and overall, it's not as efficient as it could be. So thinking about ways to make that process more efficient, StockX created its Vault NFT program. Vault NFTs are NFTs, so non-fungible tokens, that are tied one-to-one -one with physical sneakers. The physical sneakers are stored in a vault that StockX maintains and protects. And to trade those physical sneakers, all consumers need to do is trade the associated vault NFT. That NFT has a picture of the associated physical product on it, and it acts as a claim ticket to re retrieve the physical product. So if someone who's purchased the sneaker wants to actually 
obtain custody of their sneaker, they can just redeem their NFT and get the sneaker shipped to them. This was a way to kind of save on costs, improve efficiency. Um, it was a conservation effort as well, just because shipping back and forth is not as environmentally friendly as, as, um, as it could be. And so StockX implemented this program. Nike took uh, objection to this program in part because they argued that StockX was infringing their trademarks through use of Nike marks on NFTs. So this is a really interesting case from a first sale perspective because ultimately what StockX is doing is reselling Nike sneakers but using NFTs as claim tickets to do that. The NFTs accurately depict the underlying sneaker. They include the product name and an accurate image of the product that's maintained in the vaults. Um, some of the interesting questions here, though, involve what happens when the, so the underlying sneaker is combined with the NFT. Does that, is that a material alteration? Does that change the good that the consumer is purchasing such that the first sale doctrine should not apply? Um, we think it does not. We think the NFT merely acts as a claim ticket. Nike obviously has a different opinion. Um, and so here we're looking at the case law and trying to parse that case law and figure out what the right answer is. Um, an interesting place to start is a case to, that a lot of circuits point to as the origins of first sale. Um, it's a case called Prestonets v. Cotty. And Prestonets is a case involving makeup powder, in which the defendant took one party's trademark makeup powder and compiled it into a new compact case and sold that new product. And there the court found that trademark law did not um, hinder the use of the original party's trademark in connection with the sale of this new and changed product. So a trademark good that constitutes a constituent component of a new and changed overall product um, is permissible. So that's not an infringement. Some, some circuits have taken that case and said that that's the origins of first sale. And therefore, when you incorporate a trademark good into a new and changed product, that still constitutes first sale. We've seen the Ninth, Ninth Circuit do that with a case involving Bluetooth, where Bluetooth products were incorporated into automobiles. And they said, that constituted um, action that was protected under the first sale doctrine. Um, other circuits are a little bit more murky. The second circuit is a little bit more murky in particular, and they talk about the need for important disclosures and kind of clearly stating that that trademark good that's incorporated into the new and changed product is not, uh, well, the, the, the company that is the source of the trademark good that's incorporated into the new and changed product is not the source of the overall product or is not sponsoring or affiliated with the overall product. So these are some of the interesting questions that we're dealing with in this case, and these are the types of questions that come up when you're actually litigating and working on first sale issues. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. That was really fascinating. So I'm going to kick, a, kick us off with a couple questions uh, to start some discussion amongst the panelists, and then we'll have a Q&A uh, as we wrap up. So I'm really interested both from the perspective of um, of in-house attorneys and clients and brands who are looking at this thing and this potential for infringement. Um, the idea that there are so many collaborations now and there are so many brands doing new things and broadening into their products into new areas. How do you think that influences the potential for for sale issues or their, even their analysis as to whether or not they want to pursue lawsuits? in this case. Okay, I, I can start with that. And the, the short answer is I think that it helps plaintiffs enormously because essentially uh, a lot of the uh, concerns that uh, both trademark law, copyright law related uh, fields of law look at uh, in assessing infringement, in assessing harm, and assessing damages are, um, you know, to what extent is the supposedly offending use at issue uh, causing you monetary injury? To what extent is it potentially making you uh, lose sales? To what extent is it making you lose potential licenses? To what extent uh, are you not able to do deals because of this? And back in the day when, for example, um, say a clothing brand could have no conceivable uh, connection to I'm just trying to think of uh, a car brand, for example, a, uh, a vodka brand. I mean, well, nowadays, it, none of this even sounds that unusual. But, um, you know, uh, in the days when uh, collaborations, as we now call them, were relatively infrequent and relatively limited in channels, um, you couldn't necessarily credibly argue 
uh, in your briefs or to a court, you know, well, gosh, my, um, you know, my brand of children's toys uh, is very likely to have a big budget movie, you know, uh, in, in, you know, the next year. So I'm, I'm potentially losing out on, you know, the license uh, for the license to uh, make a movie out of my game Twister, you know. But nowadays, with collaborations and uh, where basically any company can connect, collaborate with any company, where any property or, you know, work can potentially, uh, you know, be uh, affiliated with, licensed by, connected to pretty much any other work, uh, it's much more reasonable for a plaintiff to be able to uh, make the argument, uh, you know, I am potentially losing out on this license with this brand. And uh, what's more, in the trademark area, there's often an interesting question about the relatedness of goods and the question about whether, uh, for example, uh, again, an alcoholic beverage. I used to work for a company called Diageo that makes alcoholic beverages. So that's that's one reason it's always almost always top of mind. You know, what is the chance that an alcoholic beverage uh, should be considered to be related to a clothing, you know, a, a T-shirt, a clothing item, whatever. And uh, it used to be very hard to sort of make that connection, and now it's uh, it's very easy to make that connection. So that's how I look at it. I don't know if other people have thoughts. I can jump in a little bit. So I mean, just as a fun aside, too, the Satan shoes that we saw earlier were in part an artistic commentary on the commonality of collaborations today. They produced a comparable Jesus shoes as well. Um, and the commentary was like Nike would collaborate with both Satan and Jesus. Um, and so it is, it is becoming more and more common. Um, and I think, too, when we see brands like Supreme that will produce, uh, well, they engage in collaborations and will produce products that are entirely unrelated to their mainstream like uh, apparel and sneakers, like a Supreme branded brick, exactly. Um, it starts to become harder and harder to, to deal with factors within the normal polar, the likelihood of confusion factors, like likelihood of bridging the gap between the party's products, because it's, n it's no longer inconceivable that a clothing company might release a Supreme branded brick. Um, and so I completely agree with Evan. I think it starts to make the test a little bit more favorable for plaintiffs. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that, um, and I also I, I'm curious what uh, Professor Mazurko has to say about. I think it w what also it makes more difficult is are these shortcut tests uh, getting past the likelihood of confusion analysis? Because again, you like the Haynes T-shirt that was up there. Uh, I mean, I can't say for sure that I didn't believe that Haynes could make tie-dye T-shirts, and and I mean, the Boring Company made a flamethrower. Um, so uh, it's it, it is it, because you can see these kinds of extensions as being possible, and even in the Hamilton context, the reason the Second Circuit uh, decided in favor of Vortic uh, was because of the disclosure, and so that's kind of one of the reasons why I centered on that is because if you think there's a potential for confusion, disclosure can can address, here's what we did. We got t-shirts, we tied, dyed them. They were Hanes t-shirts, we bought them, We and, this, and you can disclose that on the site. And I think that makes it, it, putting maybe that impetus on the entrepreneur who's engaging in the upcycling maybe makes a little more sense than trying to shortcut the analysis, I think, arguably, in an attempt to get to a conclusion that you predetermined is the right conclusion. So I'm curious if you have a thought about that. <laughs> um, just because it's conceivable that Hanes sells tie-dye t-shirts mm -hmm. does not necessarily mean that others should not also be able to tie-dye Hanes t-shirts and sell them. Like, ultimately, trademark law only comes into play here because of the resale. Like, if the t-shirts were tie-dyed and then not sold, there'd be no real trademark argument here mm -hmm. because we're not even talking about consumers' interests at that point. But it's a matter of equity mm -hmm. in some sense. Should six-year-olds have to litigate their sales <laughs> of tie-dye T-shirts in school fairs to defend them under a likelihood of confusion analysis? There is equity comes into play here. But also when talking, I kind of want to shift gears into talking about brands also entering new markets, especially NF the NFT space, where there's a lot of registration happening right now for like consumer branded goods as applied in the metaverse or as a, some kind of digital good. 
And there's this rush happening on brands' parts to register their mark so other people don't start making, uh, you know, Mickey Mouse in the metaverse or Burton snowboards in the metaverse and selling them as such. Um, that's not to say that those rights should be assumed, that we should assume that they have these rights to um, participate in creative expressions that involve trademark, that they have the right, to, that the exclusive right in, in these applications. Um, sneakers are really informative here because there is a long history of customizing sneakers and reselling them. And the third party marketplaces that facilitate these resales are able to sell both these kind of unauthorized third party custom sneakers and the authorized collaborations and consumers for the most part are able to navigate this fairly adeptly. There are of course cases that are on the margin or that cross the line, um, but I'm thinking of an environment, a pluralistic environment where brands are able to participate, but also third party creators should not be excluded because whatever they're making happens to include a branded good because basically everything we consume today contains some logo or other brand insignia. So we have to think about what the practical repercussions are in terms of how we engage with the things we buy. The alternative would be that everything we buy is actually just a limited license to use something in a way that a brand finds favorable. So building off that a little bit, I'm particularly interested to me in the intersection of sustainability and upcycling and creative expression, because I can see a very you know, interested market in goods that are upcycled, goods that are sustainable, trying to support, you know, keeping things in the in the economy, in the market, trying to reuse things, and also upcycling as a means of creativity. So you might buy something because it's upcycled, because it's sustainable, and because you like how that artist is repurposing a Louis Vuitton purse or something. Um, but at the same time, you may want to buy an upcycled Louis Vuitton purse that is an authentic purse, even if it's been significantly altered or changed. So you might be buying something for the artistic expression and because it originally was a genuine uh, designer article. So I'm curious to hear how, how that might inform your analysis or your thoughts on potentially on the use of disclaimers when it's not affiliated but it is genuine and it's important to the consumer that it is a genuine article and potentially how that impacts the creativity and creative expression analysis as well. So I'll send that back to you. If that made any sense? Yeah, no, that's a, yeah, that's a really great question. Yeah, I agree that there is a there's a huge intersection between uh, sustainability and creativity because some of the most sustainable um, uh, iterations of products are going to also have a lot of creativity associated with them as well. And so the people, you know, whether people are buying them because they're sustainable or creative, you know, that, that there's you're satisfying multiple consumer interests there. So I think that's actually a really important point. Um, I think that uh, the purpose for it probably though doesn't have a lot of impact in. Uh, the actual uh, infringement analysis, I think. And so I, I guess I would tend to, again, I, I, I tend to be a little more cautious about um, taking things out of the analysis rather than informing the analysis. Um, and so I would say, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think disclosure, you could argue that disclosure takes things out of the likelihood of confusion analysis and offers sort of maybe a shortcut to transform or to retransform your product back from a materially altered uh, good to a now uh, non-modified good for sale with the disclosure of what the modifications are. I, but I, um, I don't think that's probably the way it works, though. Um, and so, uh, but I do think, you know, one of the things that's, that's important in this area is because we're often talking about um, the original good that's being remade into something else. I think, what, you know, one of the reasons why I have some concerns about post-sale confusion is that... Um, you know, often these trademarks are going to exist apart from that initial point of sale transaction, um, and 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 potentially give trademark owners uh, some additional weight to go and uh, and pursue uh, some kind of uh, 
um, injunction or some other kind of uh, uh, infringement um, uh, activity. And so I guess what I'd say is um, I think there does need to be some modification of the law to ensure that that these things can live on, um, that can live on past the, the initial understanding that was that existed when the when the article was purchased. And and I think the way to do that is I think I would eliminate uh, post sale confusion in cases where the original good is um, part of the uh, the future product. So it's different than a, than a counterfeiting case. I can add to that that um, this gets to the division I was talking about early on between, say, the legal and the practical, mm. and the legal advice and the practical advice that I would give to a client. Mm. So if, for example, um, somebody uh, alters, say, a very high-end designer purse uh, to make it, uh, you know, to, to basically refresh it and make it, uh, you know, last another 20 years, if they make it in some way more environmentally sustainable or environmentally friendly, these are things that, again, might not necessarily uh, strictly impact the legal analysis, but very well could impact sort of the practical analysis uh, in terms of whether a client decides that they want to take action against that sort of use. You might say to a client, for example, yes, I understand that you basically want to have control over, you know, secondary sales of your product. You don't like sites like The Real Real or Rent the Runway being able to sort of sell your products or, you know, keep your products, you know, going uh, after the fact or cut into authorized resales. But take a look at this, you know, do these people seem to be acting from a place where they are trying to do something good in the world. These people seem to be doing something environmentally nice. I mean, even if you're looking at it from a purely mercenary perspective from a client's point of view, you would say, do you want this to come back and backfire on you? Do you want this to come back and have them say, oh my God, you're against sustainability. Oh my God, you're against, you know, this little old lady, you know, who, who you know, repairs these purses with her knitting circle, you know, in, uh, you know, Tuscaloosa. You know, so you, you have to like sort of look at these practical things. And again, it figures not only to sort of like the, I don't know if you want to call them necessarily the equities, but sort of, you know, the, the um, you know, the, the practicalities of whether to take action here, but it, it also could sort of, uh, you know, figure into sort of the, um, I, I assume everyone here is familiar with the Streisand effect and the idea that, mm -hmm. you know, essentially, uh, you know, to the extent that you, attempt to enforce your rights against third parties, particularly on the internet, there is a chance that it's bo both going to uh, blow up the situation far beyond where it normally would, you know, get coverage, uh, but also just massively increase your negative coverage. So you have to sort of look at it from a pure kind of cost benefits point of view, considering some of these practicalities. Can I can I just quickly add one one thing that's also I think a good a good thought about that is that you can not only just not enforce against the Tuscaloosa and person knitter, but <laughs> but but if there's a bigger concern, you could actually have a collaboration. So collaborations are actually new business strategies that are a potential um, way of dealing with this. So for example, uh, North Face. Uh, they have collaborated with a company called Rayburn in the UK, and they make these panda rucksacks from old North Face jackets. And they still have the North Face branding on, but that's okay because North Face is part of this. North Face isn't doing it, but they've licensed essentially this limited use, and, and it, it's made a more sustainable and very cuddly product. Sorry. Yeah, so I, I really like coming after what each of you had to say because I see the intersection of both. And one is who has the legal right here mm. to set constraints on what we do with the things we buy that we think we're buying and that we could do basically whatever we want with. Um, and I totally appreciate that brands in certain instances won't go after customizers or upcyclers. But should brands be in that position to enforce, to decide what they think, you know, constitutes appropriate participation in popular culture against anyone in the country who's using a consumer good and potentially reselling it after they've been altering it? Like I said before, almost everything we own and use carries brand insignia, whether it's a word mark or some logo. Probably every item in this room contains some kind of logo. Um, 
So the question is who should have control in this case? And if we think control should be in the hands of those who think that they're purchasing something outright, that it's been totally alienated to them, then that would require a change in law here. If we think that it's appropriate for brands to have this level of control over what people do with the things they buy, then we don't need a change in law here, and we could just kind of rely on brands, um, you know, good and positive participation as those who set limits on pop culture. Um, so I think that's kind of what the question boils down to in my mind. I'm not sure I have too much to add, apart from the fact that I think there are some key distinctions between refurbishing a product and taking a product in, for example, the North Face backpack example, where you're making an entirely different product that's still branded North Face and being sold. Um, and so a brand's ability to control downstream uses of its trademarks are different in those two contexts. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that distinction is important. And one point, just to clarify from the beginning of the discussion, is when we're talking about um, consumers caring that caring the underlying branded product is genuine versus not. When it's not genuine, we're outside of the realm of first sale whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So for the first sale doctrine to apply, it needs to be a genuine product. Although I'll mention that there can be sort of strange intersections there. For example, um, earlier in my career, uh, I did a fair amount of work on this subject for uh, a client, Timberland, which makes boots. And people were taking uh, Timberland boots and reconditioning them and basically uh, putting counterfeit fabric on the boots so there would be sort of counterfeit uh, Yves Saint Laurent, you know, uh, designs or counterfeit Chanel designs and so forth and basically redoing a Timberland boot with sort of a, uh, a, brand, a, a branded but a counterfeit branded fabric. So you can actually have sort of the intersection of both uh, legitimate branded product with illegitimate branded mm -hmm. additions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, endless possibilities with yeah. working things. That's impressive. <laughs> um, so I'm curious to hear a little bit more um, Professor Mazurko, about you mentioned your uh, idea of the creative expression and the Rogers test. I'd be curious to hear more how you think that should play out in this context, if you could. Um, oh, yeah. So basically, I mean, what Mark and I talked about and wrote about in the paper is we think that the fact that creative expressioning is happening creative expression is happening on a branded consumer good doesn't make it any less creative expression than if it happens on a canvas or in a motion picture or some other commonly accepted media of creative expression. Um, so the worry was that because some creative expression is being applied to a consumer good, a court would think, well, this is just the consumer product that should be subject to a likelihood of confusion analysis without taking... Um, kind of like a finer tuned approach to say, you know, what exactly is the modification here? Is it uh, communicating some kind of message, whether it has to do with the underlying brand or not? Um, so that's why we think it should be within the realm of Rogers versus Grimaldi. Yeah, I did, but you and you've noted also though before that it can be very difficult to determine what's a creative expression in this context. And you know, one I was thinking about as we were mulling over these questions, or some of them before we we got here, is that you know I think that 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 makes sense for things that um, are, are truly intended for a creative expression. But then you know where where you know where do we draw the line? I was thinking um, like going back to cars. Icon is a company that takes these. Um, uh, old car bodies and puts uh, like Corvette underpinnings in them, um, and they call them derelicts. And they're they're pretty amazing because they can pay, pretty much outpace anything that's a um, uh, a, a gas engine on the road. But arguably, they're also kind of a commentary on car culture and, and historic cars and what it means to drive something that looks like a derelict but can actually perform like a, a C8 Corvette, right? And so, I mean, is that a creative expression? They actually take some steps when they make these cars to make them look like old cars. Yeah, th this sort of gets into uh, an issue that I think that uh, the courts and in particular the Supreme Court have addressed 
a couple of times recently. I think that a lot of people here, if not everybody here, is familiar with the Meta Birkins case and the arguments that uh, the defendants made in the Meta Birkins case that essentially these uh, virtual bags that they were selling um, were uh, basically just, they, they were artworks, they were not products, they were artworks, they were artistic expression. And it seems to me that recently in both a copyright and a trademark case, the Supreme Court has kind of pushed back on sort of uh, the attempts to kind of extend Rogers v. Grimaldi and the fair use, uh, you know, uh, provisions of the Copyright Act uh, to, to essentially allow a very, very, very broad scope of uh, expression or commerce or the, the place where expression meets commerce, uh, you know, basically to sort of call that back and say, wait, you know, in terms of these, uh, these tests in both the copyright and the trademark area, in, in terms of both the fair use test and the, uh, the first sale doctrine, uh, you nevertheless have to keep in mind whether the defendant has a product, a product for sale that is competing with the plaintiff's product. And you have to, uh, in, in the context of fair use, you have to consider that in the first factor of the fair use test. Um, and in the concept of, in the context of first sale, you have to consider whether, you know, there's that competition with the, uh, you know, with the uh, plaintiff with your, with your revised or changed product. I just, have, I just have one comment on that, which is that like, films are products. Video games are products. I think they're undeniably creative expression. So it gets us into this kind of risky territory to start drawing, like it, it's hard to draw any line that isn't arbitrary between where something becomes like a digital good, it is a digital commercial good, and not an artwork and not a creative expression, whereas we, we have these established categories that would probably fit the same criteria. So you have to ask, like, when you define this kind of new form of expression online in this way, how does it carry over to categories of media that we already understand a certain way? And what repercussions does that hold beyond this new space? Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree that the Supreme Court seems to be pushing this to a zone of where if it's a competing product for the similar purpose, you're not going to be protected anymore. Um, but I think it's important to remember that for first sale, it doesn't matter if it's a competing product. Like you, the brand owner doesn't have the right to control the downstream resale of its product if that product is not materially altered. And so we have this kind of strange spectrum where you have selling the product in its original form, materially altering it such that you're subject to no defense, or altering it so much that it's expressive and you end up subject to kind of the Rogers v. Grimaldi test. And so it's important to kind of think about the different zones you could end up landing in and what that means for the product that's being sold. That's interesting. I like, I like that thought of it as a spectrum. That's a good way of laying it out. So um, going back a little bit to the purpose of the product and the purpose of the alteration, I am really interested in some of these cases where you have dramatic alterations that maintain the purpose. So your example of the cars, it's still running, it still can operate as a car, or you know, a purse that is dramatically changed. I think, I think Alex had a picture, hold on. Maybe. Yeah, it's, this is just dramatically changing the style. But it's, it's still a bag, it's still operating as a bag, but the style is much more boho and uh, yeah what have you, mm -hmm. um, versus taking something and completely changing the purpose. There was a case where um, there were white claw cans that were transformed into candles, for example. Um, and I'm curious to hear what you th think about sort of material, material alteration that maintains the original purpose or that changes it, and how that influences your thoughts on it. I'll toss that to anyone, <laughs> if anyone has any thoughts. And I think this is probably our last question before we I mean, I can jump in move to the a, audience. Just a quick response. I, th I think it's definitely context dependent. Like you would want to understand what that material alteration is, what the underlying expression is, kind of what the statement the person selling the new product is trying to make. Um, I don't think we can necessarily just look at a person and say, it's creative expression, therefore it's protected, and this should be fine under the law. Um, I think each situation needs to be analyzed within its specific context. Yeah, I think I think it's hard to to necessarily say just because it's in a new context that 
uh, you need to take it, uh, you need to apply a different analysis um, because of all the product extensions and collaborations that we, we've talked about. Um, uh, um, so, I, um, but you know, it, it should definitely inform the analysis, uh, and and and, it, and you know that's part of the test. And, and so, um, Mark Lemley and Mark McKenna, I think, if I, if I got this right, wrote a, a paper called "Irrelevant Confusion," if I remember right. So they're kind of looking at um, d confusion that could be considered confusion, but doesn't really impact the brand owner's main product line. So you know, you could argue that if it's something that's truly different truly transformed that, that there, there might even be consumer confusion but that's not relevant to the brand over and over. maybe that has some impact in the analysis and, and, and maybe even partially takes it out of the um, uh, the likelihood of confusion analysis I mean so at least that that's something so I think I think it, it definitely plays a role um, but I don't think it's preclusive like different product segment no longer um, uh, an infringement analysis yeah I'll just mention that from a plaintiff's perspective they probably would look at something like this and say, are we losing a sale? Does it hurt our brand? And if they, if they kept doing it or if this became universal, would we lose a sale or, hurt our, or would it hurt our brand? Something like this, they might consider problematic. If something like this was uh, you know, put on a pedestal and uh, you know, uh, uh, framed in the Brooklyn Museum, not so much of a problem. Yeah, I, I just want to key off this idea of did we lose a sale because, uh, like, the sale happened already, right? Like they another sale. Right. Yeah. So someone who buys a used and modified bag instead of a new bag in that case. Yeah, no, I mean, these, everything that you're saying is absolutely perfectly reasonable. Yeah. I'm just sort of giving the perspective of a brand holder. Remember, there are brands, there are, for example, publishing houses that are upset about the existence of libraries, <laughs> you know, because libraries lend out their books for free, you know. So, I mean, so did I lose a sale is not necessarily, is it reasonable to say that I lost a sale? Well, it's, it's, but, but, but the question that they would ask is, did I lose a future sale, right? Not, not did I lose ah, a Right. Sale. Did someone buy this when they could have bought one of our products instead? Yeah. 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 Well, by that same token, they would also want to prevent resales that don't make material alterations or at least recoup some value on a resale. And that happens in some, you know, legal systems, not in the United States <laughs> mm -hmm. so far. Um, but uses like that and like the the white claw candles also have access to a nominative use defense. It doesn't. They don't have to struggle to make some kind of argument that what they're doing is creative expression if it's just a component part of a new configuration. Um, what matters is that they didn't use more of the branding than was necessary. That they were truthful about the extent to which they have or don't have a relationship with the brand. Um, and. The issue is that that's a defense. So at that point, they've already been sued. They've already had to argue under the likelihood of confusion analysis. And these are expensive suits. Um, so that's why I, I bring up the equities, or I think about the equities, because the question is how much money should people who engage in these uses have to spend um, to defend what they're doing with things they lawfully acquired? Yeah, and, well, and also, you know, we haven't really talked about dilution, but don't don't forget that's an issue as well. And so, you know, you could be, uh, white claw into candles that keep the white claw. That that seems innocuous and something we'd want to support. Pepsi cans that are modified to hold uh, drugs, which was also a case that uh, the uh, modifier lost, um, is not something that Pepsi wanted to see on the market, right? So it, they believe that that diluted their brand. So, you know, I mean, I think you can come up with counters that are not so necessarily inherently positive. It seemed like they, they, they need to exist. So that, you know, it's always, that's, I mean, that's what we do in legal analysis, right? We always come up with the counter that like, oh yeah, that would be bad, children will die. All right, well, on, on that note, I think now we're going to toss it out to the audience, see if anyone has any questions. Um, good afternoon. Um, my have uh, my question is uh, for the Kate Sabah. Um, so I am very interested in the NFT products, and um, I uh, 
like uh the question is like i saw that the property contracts have made to the nft product making it as a agreement and like and paying the that uh uh i mean uh that property from the cryptocurrency like uh what do you think about this uh i mean example uh whether is it practical yeah um so i so i think one one point that's interesting and relates to the stockx case is that nfts are ultimately a technology that can be used in lots of different ways um they can be used for contracts they can be used for tracking chain of title because they create this permanent digital record on a blockchain um and so what our client would argue in StockX is that they've essentially capitalized on the use of a new technology to resell a product unchanged. And so I, like, I think NFTs have kind of myriad purposes and potential, and it's important to kind of look at that as a tech, as a technology, rather than a product in and of itself. And that's just one of the questions that's being disputed in our current case is whether the NFT that StockX believes comprises a claim ticket for the underlying physical shoe stored in the vault is actually a separate product for which StockX is subject to infringement. And so um, it's kind of a balance there. But I think the use of an NFT as a kind of means of uh, keeping track of property as chain of title or to facilitate signing contracts and payment through cryptocurrency is just another interesting use of a new technology. How you doing? Uh, Jordan Baker from the PTO. Uh, had a trademark question uh, in terms of thinking about use in commerce. Mm -hmm. When you when you look at that uh, watch image on the left, on the face of the watch, you you see Hamilton. I don't know if that's still a current mark or not. Yes. It may be okay. So um, the, the, yeah, it's it's a current mark that's owned by Swatch, but Hamilton was originally a company in Pennsylvania that. Okay, so let's switch that. I was on the the Vortic website and I see that they um, do an Illinois watch company. Uh, and so you have a face of the watch just like that, but instead of Hamilton, it just says Illinois. Well, they have the Hamilton too. Uh, yes, yeah. Assuming that Illinois watch company is long gone, so let's say it closed business many, many years ago, and all they're doing is trying to locate all of these still in existence watches, watch um, components that are you know 80 plus years old. When they start selling them, do you think the owner then? From their perspective, do you think they're creating use and commerce rights in Illinois? And you're only looking at the face. Don't forget what's on the back of the watch, because that's going to say a whole bunch of different stuff about who's making it. But I was wondering what your perspective is in terms of use and commerce in ter for uh, you know for brands that may not have been uh, otherwise existing for quite a while. So there's, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the case, but there was this case that had to do with a guitar maker from a while ago. Heritage oh, guitars, yeah, right. yeah. yeah, and they wanted to resell. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it, uh, is there any argument it's not use? I mean, it, again, it could be nominative, like Professor Mazurko is saying. But I mean, is, yeah, um, but I mean, so you know, when Swatch sued, it wasn't actually over the watches themselves but it was the advertising right so that's really where the companies generally get into trouble i think is mm -hmm. is is not so much the article but but how they promote it and so and and that's actually where the second circuit when they came out in favor of ortex said well there's really first of all there's no evidence that anybody ever followed these advertisements and were confused but also on the advertisements you also say what you're doing and it's pretty obvious so mm -hmm. that's i i I don't know. Do you, what, is, is, it's a good. It's a good question. I think the answer is yes, but I kind of. So I kind of understood your question to mean like if these, if a manufacturer is no longer making this branded good, but it's still circulating on a resale market, is it still is the mark still being used in commerce? Is there an argument that's okay. yeah? Is that, was that? I was framing it specifically in the context of something that existed a long time ago and is being you know um, altered into this new manner. Uh, so it's not something that's simply recirculating in its normal, original form of commerce, mm -hmm. like your 1950s vinyl that is still being sold on eBay. But now it's been reborn in this new form. Mm -hmm. And does the owner think, the owner, 
know, well, we're in Illinois. I saw the website the yeah. is long gone, right? Yeah. So, so does so, so, do they think, or do they have, have they, have they obtained any rights in Illinois simply by the way they presented this in Thomas? I don't know the answer. But yeah. yeah. So have they, have they generated new rights in Illinois? That, yeah, that's an interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of a comparable situation. I know that uh, there's a relatively new watch company, not that new now, but Shinola. Yeah. yeah. And Shinola basically took a dead brand, yeah. which I don't believe was actually associated with watch watches before, mm -hmm. um, and basically just created a, a new vital brand out of, uh, out of Shinola. They, they set up a shop in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, honestly, they're, as I understand it, you know, basically a private equity company decided they wanted to make a watch. They, they did some surveys to say, w you know, where should we assemble this watch to get the most authenticity, you know, to get the most, you know, credit basically for doing so. And so people will buy our watch. Uh, they came up with Detroit. Uh, so they started making these Shinola watches uh, in Detroit which they now advertise as, you know, Detroit built, Detroit company. You know, it's just, you know, it was, it was chosen almost at random just because it was marketable. Uh, but, but there's a brand that was basically, you know, brought back from the dead for a completely separate product. I, I don't know if that actually answers your question, but it's the closest thing I could think of. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, I'm Patricia Campbell from the University of Maryland. And I totally get what you're saying about um, sustainability and creativity and, you know, all of these good things. And obviously, six-year-olds shouldn't have to litigate for whatever it is that they did. But if we kind of soften up, shall we say, the material alteration theory in the way that the panel's often suggesting, do you have concerns about how that's going to impact those cases where the, the alteration is so material that it creates issues relating to reliability of the product that's being resold or creates safety concerns when that product ends up in a military system or critical infrastructure or something like that. I mean, my, my own research has shown that there is so little litigation over those kinds of material alterations already. And if we start to pull back on the doctrine even more, is that going to even further chill litigation? Or the, the willingness of the DOJ to bring an action for trafficking. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I definitely think that, that safety is a separate issue than brand goodwill, and, and I think that is a part of some of the cases. I mean, there have been cases of involving repackaging pharmaceuticals, for example, that have definitely um, uh, centered on the idea that now this is no longer what it was sold as, or we can't guarantee the chain of title to ensure that it's a safe pharmaceutical, and that's certainly an impetus behind it. And so, yeah, I, th I, I certainly I would agree that there's a risk that um, if you know any potential you know negative effect of of, of making the test harder to win um, potentially impacts those cases. I'm not sure if those are. Uh, necessarily sustainability cases, and I, I guess you know the, the 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 way around that is again if you so where the courts have kind of said that's something you could surmount is what the disclosures so the Presonet case um, basically was a disclosure case in a lot of ways right the Supreme Court in that case said repackaging the powder as long as you tell people what you're doing is fine. Right, so it was maybe it was the the seminal first sale case, but it was also one of the first kind of disclosure cases and letting people know, and also the champion spark plug case, you know, where basically it's like if you say what you're doing, then that's okay. Yeah, the, so there is a case. I, I talked a little bit about the boat that used a Suzuki snowblower as its mm -hmm. engine. That was a real case. Um, it was a real trademark case. But you have to wonder, like, is should trademark law be the law that's intervening here? Or are we talking more about like product safety and consumer protection that doesn't really concern a trademark owner? Um, so that's not to say that these uses should be lawful full stop. It's a question of how far should trademark law be intervening in what people do with the goods they buy and then resell. I would, I would add to that. I, I, I think it's, it's not entirely divorced from goodwill. I mean, it, safety issues with the product reflect yeah. negatively yeah, on the brand right. downstream. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. it's still important to remember that this is this yep. is an issue for brands too. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't necessarily know though that uh, cabining material alteration a little bit um, or making it a little softer 
would necessarily impact the safety issues. Because when we're thinking about like creative alterations versus like a breakdown of a product that's used by the military, those, those feel pretty distinct to me. Um, but maybe, maybe it is a bit of a slippery slope. I, I actually can think of a couple of examples where this, this sort of came into play. Um, I know in the past uh, pharmaceutical companies, as, as you mentioned, um, even when you're dealing with sort of over-the-counter products like vitamins and lip balm, uh, there have been cases, well, or rather I should say there have been situations, although I don't think they've actually been litigated to a conclusion, uh, where uh, companies have become aware of gray market imports, for example, of vitamins and lip balm and items like that. And essentially what the, the companies have said in going after the folks who are doing this gray market import uh, is, you know, because this has not gone through our normal channels of trade, uh, we have no idea if it has been altered or diluted or if it's counterfeit or if it's otherwise problematic. Therefore, you know, the resale of this product, it, it, the gray market sale of this product uh, is, you know, uh, the fact that it has not gone through our, our channels of trade should be considered essentially a material alteration. And that in itself is sufficient to allow us to sort of take action and try to shut it down. I think, I think the courts have been pretty light in what they require for a material alteration. And so, yeah, you would have to be careful. I mean, one of the more extreme cases I, I read was um, yeah, there was a former, um, um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? So, um, a licensee of ADT um, who stopped working for ADT but kept all the signs and then just sold the ADT signs. Now, those were absolutely legitimate, not counterfeit ADT signs. <laughs> But then everyone who bought them and just stuck them in front of their house, well, I mean, <laughs> and so, I mean, the, you know, there's an argument that nothing was really materially altered about the signs except the contract that was not part of it, right? So that's, that's you know, so, so uh, you know, I think maybe that's one of the more extreme cases, but, but it, it, you're right. I think your, your point is correct that courts have generally been pretty light on what they consider to be a material alteration. So I think you, you, you one would be, one might be concerned about um, modifying that test. I might circle back to the, um, like the, t the test of considering whether it's left the brand's chain of custody or, or mm. um, chain of sale, because I think that sort of undermines the entire doctrine of first sale. Like, like at a certain point, mm. once, a cons once it's in the possession of the consumer, the brand is no longer tracking those subsequent sales, nor does it have the right to control or govern those subsequent sales. And so mm -hmm. that it's hard to draw that distinction there. Unfortunately, I think oh, <laughs> I think uh, we are out of time. So I'd like to thank all of our wonderful panelists. I really enjoyed our discussion, and I think we're up to having a break before our last couple panels of the day. So thank you all very much. Thank you.